I'm John Rouser. I'm a principal engineer at, uh, at Amazon.com, and uh, I was invited here to speak to you today about a career in data science, and I am a, a data scientist. Uh, but instead of talking about a career uh, in the abstract, I'd like to begin with a story uh, that I hope will put some things into context, and that story involves this man, Tobias Mayer. Uh, this is the man that I will claim was the first data scientist. Mayer was an astronomer, and he was very interested in the motions of the moon. Uh, you might have learned in school that the moon always presents the same face to the Earth, and that's mostly true. Uh, we actually had no idea what most of the far side of the moon looked like until we sent uh, spacecraft to orbit the moon in the 1960s. But the idea that the moon always presents uh, the exact same face to the Earth, that isn't quite perfectly true. The moon actually wobbles a little bit every month, and oops, here's what that wobble looks like. Uh, there we go. So let's see that once more. So this motion is known as the libration of the moon, and explaining it is what Mayer is famous for. So the motion has a couple of causes. First, the moon's orbit around uh, the Earth. It's not a perfect circle with the Earth at the center. Its orbit is an ellipse. And second, the axis of the moon's rotation isn't perfectly perpendicular to the Earth's orbit around the sun. It's actually tilted a little bit. And so these two little imperfections, they show up as that wobble. And to explain it, Mayer looked at the face of the moon. In particular, he looked at the position of a certain crater, Manilius, which is the little bright spot at the tip of that arrow. Uh, and as the face of the moon wobbles over time, that little spot moves along with it. So Mayer sat down and he did a whole bunch of spherical trigonometry to describe that motion. And he arrived at, at this equation, which might look frightening. Uh, but all you need to know about this equation is that x, y, and z are quantities that he could measure by looking at the face of the moon, while alpha, beta, and theta are unknown quantities that he was trying to get estimates for. And so at this point, a simple strategy might occur to folks that remember their high school math classes. If you observe x, y, and z on three separate occasions, then you'd get three equations in three unknowns. And you can use basic algebra to solve for alpha, beta, and theta. And the problem is that Mayer didn't have three observations. He had 27 observations. Uh, and here, Mayer faced the key problem of the modern data scientist. He had more data than he could handle with his current tools, and he had to invent his way out of the situation. And so here's what he did. He organized uh, the equations into three groups of nine each, and he carefully chose the groups. The first had large positive values for this coefficient of alpha. The second had large negative values. Uh, and then the third group had the leftovers, where the values are relatively closer to zero. And now having chosen these three groups, he added each group up to arrive back at three equations. And Mayer argues that these three equations can take the place of 27 because each one has been formed in the most advantageous manner, by which he meant uh, that by maximizing the contrast in the coefficients, he ensured that he would get good estimates for alpha, which was the most important uh, parameter of his analysis. And this alone was a huge conceptual leap, uh, but it actually gets even better. Mayer solves his three equations and gets these values for his unknown parameters, and then he goes on to make an argument about the accuracy of these estimates. Mayer says that because these values were derived from nine times as many observations, <laughs> They, we can therefore conclude, people in the audience are clever, you people uh, know your statistics, we can conclude that they are nine times more accurate. Uh, I'll get to the error in just a second. Uh, and and uh, this is, though, as far as I know, the first time in history that someone made a quantitative argument that more data is better. Uh, that with more data, you get better models. And coming up with this idea is what makes Mayer the first data scientist in my mind. And of course, we now know that Mayer got it slightly wrong. Uh, we now know that error drops not in direct proportion to the number of observations, but with the square root of the number of observations. So his estimates were, at best, three times more accurate. But still, you can hardly fault the man uh, for getting the details a little bit wrong when he had just taken the first tentative steps towards least squares regression. Uh, and at this point, it's interesting to contrast Mayer with another person facing a similar problem. Just one year earlier, Leonhard Euler was trying to reconcile small perturbations in the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn. And when faced with 
uh, with six equations in two unknowns, a situation very much like Mayer's Euler Balked. He wrote, by the combination of two or more equations, the errors of the observations and of the calculations can multiply themselves. So Euler, possibly the greatest mathematician of all time, he could not make the conceptual leap that Mayer did. So why is the question? And here's the answer, or at least I think the answer. If we lay out Euler and Mayer on the continuum of mathematics, Euler is by far the greater mathematician. But Mayer had something else. Mayer had what I'll call engineering sense. Uh, he was a working astronomer, and he was dealing with observations that he himself had made. He understood his instrument and the kinds of errors that it could introduce, and he had an intuitive sense for what was a likely error, while Euler, on the other hand, was a mathematician, and he was used to thinking in terms of the maximum error that could creep into a series of complex calculations. And so it was Mayer's engineering sense that put him squarely in the realm of data scientists. That is, people with both some engineering skills and some mathematical skills. And when I put the label math on the x-axis of this chart, I really mean applied math, or more specifically fields like statistics, or econometrics, or operations research, uh, but applied math in general. And in modern times, the kind of engineering we mean is usually software engineering, or more broadly, just programming. Uh, but both skills are important. Uh, without the math, you're just a software engineer, and I say this to you as somebody that spent 10 years as just a software engineer. Uh, you might be able to move around huge volumes of data, but you don't have the skills required to extract insight from that data. And without the engineering, you're just a statistician. Again, I say this to you as somebody that spent the last half of my career learning statistics. And the obvious thing that, the, that big data people will say about the pure statisticians uh, is that they lack the ability to invent and to implement new computational approaches to large data problems. And that might be true, uh, but there are so many important problems that actually fit in memory on a single machine that, uh, that off-the-shelf uh, uh, computational systems, they'll often do you just fine. I think what engineering skills really bring to the table uh, is the ability to fish for yourself, right? You, don't, you can go and get the data, uh, you can clean it, you can reformat it uh, without talking to anyone else. You don't have to sit there waiting for your pristine data set to arrive on a silver platter. And so someone who has both the engineering skills to acquire and to manage large data sets and the analytical skills to extract value from data and present that value to a broad audience, those people are the data scientists. So okay, so how do you get there? What is the path to this promised land of data science? I don't think it's school, uh, at least not yet. As far as I know, there is no degree program in data science. We are still in the very early stages of this discipline. The closest thing I can think of is something like a degree in computer science while taking a lot of classes in statistical machine learning, or perhaps a statistics degree with a really heavy emphasis on computational methods. Uh, my personal path goes something like this. I graduated 18 years ago with degrees in aerospace engineering and computer science. Aerospace engineering is a pretty math-heavy discipline, so I started with a decent math foundation. And for about 10 years, I worked as just a straight-ahead software engineer. But I was lucky to sit next to some really smart math guys, and I picked up some skills in machine learning and statistics. But it was in 2003 when I joined Amazon that things really changed for me. So Amazon is a playground for smart, data-oriented people. Uh, it's a place where evidence-based arguments are prized above all else. Uh, and it was at Amazon that I finally figured out that if you can code and you can answer business questions with data, uh, that people really, really like that. Uh, and so I taught myself uh, more analytical techniques like statistical modeling and data visualization, and I did less and less production level software engineering, which means that those skills have really atrophied a little bit over time. So that's my 18 year path, uh, but there are all kinds of crazy paths that you can take. <laughs> And none of them are right or wrong. Uh, and the point of all this is that if you want to be a data scientist, you probably have to grow yourself into the role. This isn't, there's no direct route, as far as I know. Uh, and if you want to hire data scientists, it's probably going to be very hard to identify them. Uh, and you might consider growing them on your own. You, it might be easier to find a promising software engineer or a promising statistician and give them problems that will let them grow into the role. And it doesn't have to take 18 years, I'm just slow. 
Uh, so it's worth pointing out that these two axes, engineering and applied mathematics, these are just the price of admission. Uh, these skills get you in the door, uh, but there are other skills that you need to really be successful. But to show more axes, I'm going to have to switch from this two-dimensional uh, scatter plot to something that can display more dimensions, like a polar area chart. Uh, and it's cool that this is perhaps the one conference in the world where I can just say polar area chart and people will know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you don't know, uh, it should become obvious in a minute. Uh, so uh, I've already argued that math and engineering are important. And the third dimension that I'll add to the mix is writing. Uh, so communication in, in general is important, but writing is just incredibly important. In my experience, it's the first major difference between mediocrity and greatness. Uh, so writing is the key to having impact. Here's a little mantra I say to anybody who will listen. If it isn't written down, it never happened. If people from the future can't find your work, then it is as though you never did it. If your writing is so opaque that people can't understand your work, then you may as well have never done it. But to put it more positively, a well-written report is bigger than you are. Your writing can outlive you. So just think of our hero, Tobias Mayer. He wrote his little report on the moon, actually big report on the moon in 1750. And in the years following, his work was read by astronomers all over the world. And snippets of it were read by you just minutes ago, some 250 years later. So the written word scales. And it scales near infinitely. And it has since the invention of the printing press. So writing is a critical skill for a successful data scientist. Another critical skill is skepticism. If you take a skeptical attitude to, towards your analysis, you'll look just as hard for data that refutes your hypothesis as you will for data that confirms it. A skeptic attacks the same question from, from many different angles and dramatically increases their confidence in the results. And now skepticism might seem different from the other things that I've listed here. You might argue that skepticism is a trait. Uh, that it can't be learned. And I actually worried for a long time that this was the case. And since I think that skepticism is such an important skill for the data scientist, I worried whether data scientists could only be born and not taught. And then I found somebody who had taken a stand on the issue. Uh, Hadley Wickham is a computer scientist and a statistician. Yeah, absolutely. A round of applause for Hadley Wickham. Uh, author of uh, numerous R packages, among them ggplot uh, and, and uh, ply, or ggplot, I claim, uh, is uh, the tool that improved my productivity more than any other uh, in the, whatever last year was, 2010. Um, so uh, Hadley Wickham is a, a computer scientist and a statistician currently at Rice University, and he teaches a class called Applied Statistical Computing. But for all intents and purposes, it's an introductory class in data science. And what I found remarkable about this class was that the grading standard specifically called out skepticism as one thing that students' work would be judged on. Here's the guidance he gave to students. He said, you'd get an F if you accepted your findings uncritically or you made leaps of logic without justification. And you'd get an A plus if you were critical of your findings and used many different techniques to verify unintuitive results. And upon reflection, I've become convinced that you can teach people skepticism. It seems like a very hard thing to learn on one's own. I frankly have no idea how I acquired it, but I do believe that with proper coaching, people can learn to be skeptical. And the last skill I'll add to the mix uh, is curiosity. Curiosity is important for the obvious reason that it makes you productive. Uh, so a great data scientist is the one that lies awake at night with a question rolling around in her head, trying to craft just the right query that will crack a problem open or the one who forgets to eat lunch because the data they got uh, just a minute ago is so incredibly interesting. Uh, but the real reason curiosity is important is when some new dimension shows up, the curious person is excited to race out and become an expert on that topic. So some examples from my career include learning about structural inefficiencies of the Japanese stock market, the vagaries of airline pricing, and the history of TCP IP, and why it puts a lower bound on website performance. Every new problem domain that you tackle uh, will require mastering one or more new areas of expertise, and only an intensely curious person will enjoy that work. So there's my top five skills for the data scientist, math, engineering, writing, skepticism, and curiosity. If you've got these covered, you're in a good position for a successful career as a data scientist. Uh, but I should take a moment to define what I mean by success 
right? A lot of people, they seem to think that success means honorifics, uh, little tags that get applied to your name on your business cards. People want to be, you know, the vice president of such and such or the chief something officer or the principal blah de blah you know? But let me suggest another definition of success. To me, success is happiness. And one of the most robust results from happiness research is that people are happy when they are engaged in meaningful work. People are happy when they are contributing to something larger than themselves, when they are making the world a better place, even if only in small ways. So to make this idea more concrete, let me close with another story. Uh, on September the 29th, 1707, Sir Cloudesley Shovel, then Commander-in-Chief of the British Fleet, set sail from Gibraltar and headed home. As he left Gibraltar, he sailed north along the coast of Spain, and his fleet was beset by terrible weather with near constant storms. As he crossed the Bay of Biscay, the weather got worse, and as the fleet entered the English Channel, they thought they were sailing just west of the island outpost of Ushant off the Brittany coast, when in fact they'd been blown more than 100 miles off course, and they were sailing into the notoriously dangerous waters off the Isles of Scilly, S-C-I-L-L-Y. So before they could recognize their error, four ships in the fleet struck rocks and sank, taking with them some 2,000 men. This monument marks the spot where Admiral Shovel's body was found washed ashore two days later. This is one of the greatest disasters in British naval history. And an investigation determined that a key cause of the catastrophe was the ship's inability to determine their position east to west. This was the greatest unsolved problem in open water navigation known as the longitude problem. And it turns out that when Tobias Mayer was studying the motions of the moon, the real problem he was working on was the longitude problem. Because if you can predict the motion of the moon very accurately, then you can measure the distance between the moon and some nearby star, and from there you can work out your longitude, a method that was used by ocean-going ships for nearly 100 years. So Mayer not only took the first steps toward data science, he did it in the service of some greater good. His work saved lives. He changed the world for the better. And this seems a worthy goal. If what you want is success, then do something important. Do something that people will care about. If you do that, not only will you be happy, but all the trappings of success will inevitably follow. That's all I have. Thanks for your time.